I think part of the challenge about public transport and why um, it the conversation is still challenging is because it's seen from a glass lens. A BRT system is dependable because the vehicles are not stuck in traffic. One of the, I think, key issues that I face, particularly in summer, that it becomes really inhospitable to be, you know, walking to one of these locations, waiting even five minutes there. And I, if I have the option of, you know, calling an in-drive or an Uber or Kareem, I would you really do it. And I do have that option. I know a lot of people don't. But uh, people who are, you know, white collar jobs, they do have that option. Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Front Seat to Climate Change. Today we have with us Gulrez Khan, uh, who is a design specialist and he's uh, worked a lot around topics concerning urbanism and public transport. And uh, pu public transport is a uh, you know, topic that is very close to everyone's heart, especially anyone who's worked in the environmental and climate sphere. And the reason for that is that it's one of the easiest ways to offset your emissions and also make people's lives easier, especially in a hot climate country like Pakistan. So that is where we start our conversation today. Thank you for, you know, joining us, Kulrez, and uh, we've had these conversations informally so many times, and I wanted to have you here to just talk about that. It's very simple to understand. We just had the World Environment Day, the climate benefits that we can quantify are the easiest when you talk about transport and also it makes just logical sense to deploy it. But why does a country like Pakistan uh, continuously resist this transition? Uh, people in positions of power and people also who are you know, well educated do not fully understand this. Uh, where do you think the gist of the issue starts about and how can we you know, tackle this on? Uh, thanks, David. Thanks for having me here. Pleasure to be here. Um, I think part of the challenge about public transport and why um, it the conversation is still challenging is because it's seen from a glass lens. Right? Because for a long time uh, we didn't invest in public transport, so the quality of it, you know, went down, and only the poorest were using it because they had no other option. Right? Anyone who, as soon as they could get some means, went on to motorbike. So this coincides with the rise of the motorcycle. Motorcycle gave you both autonomy and was feasible, right? So, but you if the poorest of the poor to use it. That's why people think this is not worth investing in, right? They still take that lens to it. So, a lot of middle-income folks also think because we have an aspiration set here that you know the richer you are, you should have a car and so on. Um, and that's why it's hard for people to wrap their head around. Unlike in the world, when these people travel, when they go to London or elsewhere, they will use it. But when it comes to Pakistan over here, they feel that this is a no-go conversation. So, wo ek jo buy-in hota hai public ka, it's hard to get. Mm. So, at the same time, you mentioned how we go abroad and we tend to use public transport. And uh, it also looks cool over there doing it. That you've seen this in movies and uh, Bollywood goes there to Europe, uses their trains and shows it off. All these action movies have these segments inside trains. So they've, they've marketed it in a way that it's attractive. Uh, but when we look at our public transport, we've also you know, put up these connotations to it, which are derogatory. You know, we call it Jangla Bus. We call them Lal Bus. And, uh, and that really, I think, in my mind, uh, again, is uh, where the upper class decides that this is something that the poorest of the poorest or also people who are not just worth interacting with will use. Uh, at the same time, this, these recent few years, uh, there has been a push for public transport. Uh, part of it is possibly, uh, you know, a push from our development donor sort of uh, complex that forces upon projects to us. But also, I think government is interested in saving fuel. And again, this argument starts with saving dollars, not really benefiting the public. But how do we shift that conversation away from these just these conversations that World Bank will give money for this project, okay, we should do it, or oh, we will save dollars for fuel. Why not just make it a human angle to it? And how do we humanize this subject? Um, so I'll answer two things separately. I think one, uh, to make public transport desirable, it's the quality of the infrastructure and the quality of the vehicles. So yeah. Usme, we've seen a massive shift, right? People, when they take the red bus, um, when you step in it, it's air conditioned, you know, the bus looks nice. It makes a world of a difference. So, yeah, so perception is a lot of the moment you start using it. Same thing with Orange Line. The moment you step on the train, right, you're suddenly wowed by the quality of the infrastructure. 
Now, good quality infrastructure is expensive, and this is where the conversations around why was this so expensive to build, right, comes in. So you can't have both, right? So I think people in that class, uh, in that class conversation in their head, say, no, this is for poor. We shouldn't spend too much. So let it be cheap, quality, poor quality, and we will not use it. So this is not for us. To change this entire thing, you'll have to invest in it. It will be expensive. It'll be expensive to build. It'll be expensive to maintain. Air conditioned vehicles, air conditioned sta uh, stations, stations that are glass enclosed. These things cost money to build and maintain, right? So, this conversation simultaneously can happen. So, I think uh, there's a dissonance in our people's head. Um, to your second question, I think the push. You're right. Shuru, uh, I think some of it was competition. I know. Uh, so, okay, no. Let me fold back. These plans have been in the works since the 60s and 70s. So, as early as of 70s, ki reports me, you'll see ADB ki, uh, you know, those consultant ki, jab master plans bane the, ke public transport hona chahiye. The cost was prohibitive. So governments didn't invest in this. The 80s and 90s were not an era where you know uh, civilian governments had a lot of money to spend on this, right? The push then gets revived in 2000s, right, during Musharraf, and these just the approvals and all these process takes five six years. So the first one you see is 2011, the Lahore Metro bus. Uh, partially that came from the relationship with Turkey and Shahbaz Sharif's sort of relationship with them, because Turkey may you know this, there was a big push on public transportation. Wo bhi recent push hai wahan pe bhi. So I think that moment had arrived globally. Pakistan maybe that moment arrives. Now I I feel the you're right that that save fuel ki taraf se zada wo tha, ke this helps us save fuel, but it actually protects you from public anger also. Because if you have a motor if you have a motorbike and every every day you go fuel it, you see the fuel price. When you take public transport, you don't see the fuel price every day. So the moment you know you put people keep them further away from the fuel price changes, so the public anger jo har din baad, jo hai, that comes out, oh, rupe bad gaye, rupe bad gaye, you will save yourself from that as a government. So I think that should, I feel there is that defining factor now. I think now, and then you saw the interprovincial competition because Punjab did it, therefore KP did it, therefore Sindh was forced its hand, now Quetta is doing it. So I think good old rivalry between these provincial governments and the parties and control them mm. is now driving it. Um, I'm happy with whatever it takes to <laughs> drive this conversation forward. So uh, you've mentioned these couple of projects and I think you're one of the few people who've gone around to <laughs> take a ride in all of them. You know, so you, you've documented it, I've seen your articles. What are the three things that stand out for you as in the features built into the system that are really serving the people? And what would be the three gaps that you would want to fill in the next 12 months? Fantastic. Uh, so, I think I did a piece which is the best service, right, uh, last year uh, for Dawn. And Usme, not surprisingly, it was the Peshawar Metro bus that was the best. And there were certain metrics. Of course, one is uh, usage, ridership, right? So, a best system is the one that most people use, like a significant number of people use. Uh, financially, it is robust, right? Uh, it's easy to use and so and you see diversity of users so not just one kind of users right so some of the best some of the good things about that was um, dependability right when a brt system is dependable because the vehicles are not stuck in traffic by giving a right of way you're ensuring that the bus will come every three minutes and for a public transport sy uh, system and there's enough research done by ucla that shows that the number one factor for adoption is not the price it's not the quality it's dependability right so if you ensure dependable service people will get people will switch to it right so i think that's what the peshawar brd system does really well two is the quality um it's air conditioned and the, in our country where you're hot most of the year round this is such an add-on yeah. like yeah. if on the same route i have one of the old buses and the new bus i would wait a few more minutes because i know the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes will be air conditioned and that's such a blessing um so I think there's the quality of the vehicle and the infrastructure. Uh, the third is integration, right? So obviously a single BRT line will not go everywhere and people don't live off the line and work off the line. So how do you integrate into broader? And so Peshawar did that really well with the feeder network. One of the things that Lahore has suffered massively from, even though they were the first to do it, the feeder network was never put in place or with the attention to detail that Peshawar did. So that's very relevant. I think uh, I've been to Peshawar a bunch of times. Peshawar benefits from this, uh, I think, both its geography because, you know, you have mountains on one side so they can't really expand into it. But they have this uh, since ages, since uh, they've been around the GT road and 
the system itself now serves the entire and I've heard that recently they've expanded towards the eastward side and with the new feeder route yeah. uh, system as well. But all of these things aside, um, while I was in Peshawar, I walked from Kent to the nearest station. Uh, in Karachi, I would have my office used to be in near Dotalwar, so you know, you have a stop over there, you just get onto the bus. And uh, even in Lahore and Islamabad, it's you know, you can access it as long as you're somewhere near the system. But one of the, I think, key issues that I face, particularly in summer, that it becomes really inhospitable to be, you know, walking to one of these locations and waiting even five minutes there. And I, if I have the option of you know calling an in-drive or an Uber or Kareem, I would you really do it. And I do have that option. I know a lot of people don't, but uh, people who are you know white-collar jobs, they do have that option. How do you reduce that in hospitality? That uh, I think it's an issue with our land use planning and everything else. That both it is more effective for non-motorized transport and also other simply walking to a location and waiting in a relatively better space? So, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I think you're right. Uh, I don't know if the conversation should be focused on people like us, you and me, who have alternative, right? So I think, one, let's put us away, right? We're not the primary users. We're not going to become the primary users until a long time, you know. So what about the people who use it, right? So Usme, how do we make it comfortable for them to wait, to stay, to cross the last mile or whatever? Uh, and that comes to how we build our cities, right? So because of these uh, overlapping jurisdictions, so who owns the sidewalk, who builds the bus station, who builds the approach and stuff? Uh, with Karachi, the red bus, for instance, one of the reasons that delayed the putting of bus stops was because most of the route falls under multiple containment areas, yeah. right? So getting permission from them, uh, and they flatly said no first, and so on, right? So that's the core problem because there is no, so. The transport department does not have control over the entire route end to end and they will never have it right so does the government at, at least at the provincial level uh, take it seriously enough that it creates that secondly you saw for instance with lahore for over a decade you couldn't put uh, advertisements because that belongs to some other department or authority and they won't let you put it so changing laws to do that and so on so i think to a broader question, the challenge of when will we see a cohesive network that is built, you know, with for people like this for to use public transport, that's going to be really complex given our the way our uh, governance systems, at least at the third level, at the city level, are structured. So I'm glad that you brought about these, uh, brought up these departments and jurisdictions because my next question was about political economy, and uh, there are institutions in our country which are technically not meant to be a part of the urban planning sphere, but they have uh, overdue importance in it. Uh, all these DHAs or Bahria towns, these are sort of uh, areas where you do not have bus routes. I even, uh, you know, I had a colleague once upon a time in airlift and they mentioned that they couldn't even get permissions to put up uh, pickup sites there. So this, this remains a question that uh, uh, our bus network sort of too, for you know, working class too poor to be put in place in very rich posh housing areas. Uh, how do we deal with the political economy? Because this is both an uh, environmental issue, a uh, public spending issue and also a development issue. And our development is very closely linked to our political economy. And what would it take for to finally you know, resolve this puzzle? <laughs> so I think this neatly circles back to that this is a class issue more than anything else, right? And so the DHAs or upper income neighborhoods, even though they utilize services of people who need public transport, they don't want their infrastructure around them because it brings down the property value, right? Or it will be seen as driving down property value. Shouldn't it be property value? That, that has happened in the case of Firozpur Road in Lahore. No, no you'll so Firoz, because Firozpur Road is not upper income neighborhood, right? The mm -hmm. factories and the other things, right? So this is, not, I think, absolutely. In fact, if we did a map of um, all of the flyovers in the city, and there's not a single one in all of DHA Karachi. Mm -hmm. There are flyovers that go into it, but never in it. Yeah. All the flyovers are elsewhere in the city, right? Because flyovers have a, a you know, um, effect on your property value. They bring them down, right? So I think they're very smart what, what they're doing. So I think your only hope is to align with these stakeholders. You cannot do it without them, right? And you know, I mean, you know, I'm someone who's very realist about these things. You need to uh, loop them in. There are obviously corridors. Uh, in fact, in DHA on 26th Street, a bus does run. So it's not, they're not completely opposed to the idea. I think what needs to be done is the, the 
provincial government and this is where you cannot hide from politics you can't have favorite parties and unfavorite you don't know who's going to be in power you need to know how to work with every one of them the provincial government has to take the lead on this this is a provincial issue right uh, it should be a municipal issue but it isn't right now it's a provincial issue uh, the provincial party has the muscle to negotiate with other state institutions right uh, and that's where you bring them to the negotiating table for route definition for building infrastructure along the route for deciding routes yeah. right looking at who's using routes and so on you can't do without it. it it's hard in pakistan because it's such a governance patchwork but if you abandon it then there is no alternative mm -hmm. then you'll just build systems yeah. that don't work no completely understandable i think we'll uh, close up our episode here and before usually i close it up i ask my guest uh, do a short speed round um, i'll throw these three words at you when you're supposed to say something that comes to your mind okay. so heat wave air conditioning Okay, floods. Hmm. It's such a distant issue. Like you know, I, it, as a city resident, it doesn't affect you as much. Yeah, yeah. So true. unfortunately, I think that's. Last one is very simple: climate change, public transport. <laughs> so that's very relevant. So thank you for joining us. Uh, this was a pleasure to have you and. we thank our audience who's been here and uh, stay tuned because we have more guests and experts lined up at front seat to climate change